reason that Republicans are done with their race is that today, the last opponent to former President Trump, Nikki Haley, exited the race. After besting every other candidate in this field and building her candidacy from something that initially sounded fairly vague, at times even meek, according to critics, she developed over time her message and her operation into the most enduring, credible, conservative case against the unpopular, indicted former president. For a strong America, for a proud America, I am running for president of the United States of America. We have to face the fact that Trump is the most disliked politician in America. We can't win a general election that way. I said I wanted Americans to have their voices heard. I have done that. I have no regrets. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. Those last lines from Haley came today. She landed some punches. She built a following. Now she leaves with that note of some kind of hopeful or resilient grace, if you want to call it that, but also no rush to announce her intentions for an endorsement. So that's the big news tonight. That's a contrast to basically all other top Republicans who clashed with Trump. His primary opponents that you may remember, they rushed to endorse. His sometimes Senate foe, Mitch McConnell, also made news today by going through with it and publicly endorsing Trump as the presumptive nominee, a path that caps McConnell's retirement amidst what is an increasingly MAGA party among the elites anyway. So what did Haley do in her campaign? Tonight seems like a fitting night to take a look because it matters for the future and this rematch race. So I'm going to go through a couple of things. One, she broke a barrier that few of the D.C. pundits initially predicted. She drew the most votes of anyone other than the former president in their field. And a former president's like a quasi-incumbent. This was also, we should note, a field of men. And in a party fixated on so many so-called macho issues, their word, not mine, let's note tonight, Haley, now the first woman to win any Republican state primary ever. Pretty striking. Took until 2024 for that to happen. And thus, she is also the first woman of color to do so. Second, while several Republicans memorably ran as fairly predictable MAGA mini-me's, Haley demonstrated a pretty strong block of voters exist who oppose Trump. She exposed cracks in the support that he needs, that he has to fix if he has any hope of making up what was his 2020 deficit in this rematch to win in November. Now, there's no reliable way to predict elections. I've told you that before. That's just a fact. You got to wait and listen to the voters. But history also shows how often the D.C. pundits get it wrong, and they rarely admit it. They spent months talking up Haley's mostly male rivals, including especially Ron DeSantis. In other words, before the Republican voters ever spoke, we heard a lot about Ron DeSantis. And we also heard that Trump has a supposed stranglehold on Republican voters. Well, the only way to test that claim is to check in with Republican voters. And it turns out, even as those other candidates dropped, even as the headlines blared that Trump was going to be the inevitable nominee, and some of that proved to be the case yesterday, there was still a very large, underappreciated, often undercounted share of Republican primary voters who were against Trump. So we learned that over these three months, powered often by Haley. Last night, we had more people go out to the polls than any other day this year. So we'd be remiss here on the news if we didn't share with you some of that news, because Haley's campaign also showed breadth. Overall, now we can show you over a quarter of primary voters went for Haley in 11 different states. That's sort of her floor. A larger share went against Trump distributed across other candidates, if you count those early states. Then the news gets worse for Trump when you look at where he's bleeding out. Because any Republican nominee can be fine in safe red states like Texas, can afford to even lose a few points over any reason and still win. Any generic Republican wins Texas. But Haley showed Trump's largest problems in his party are in the states that he actually would need to win back for a November victory, like Colorado, or states he needs to hold on to, like North Carolina. And the places with more independents who often can define general elections Another problem for Trump, because Haley won 40% in New Hampshire, 35% in Virginia. 
Historically, you need United Party support to win these states. And historically, Republican candidates who have rebounded from divided primaries often did so by forging a team, be it on the ticket or through endorsements that healed primary cracks. But Trump aides know what he may be loath to admit today. The candidate who he did beat last night, and that was a big headline, Nikki Haley, could actually have more sway over his election chances than many other factors, including what he says and what he posts online, all the things that may occupy his time. He may not like that, but that is one of the iron laws of divided primaries that history shows. Not a prediction, but more of an observation from the past. Now, if what I showed you briefly there, the Bush-Reagan reunion where they decided to make up and campaign together, if she joined him and made a strong pitch to her voters, who are this sizable group in some key places, that could matter a lot. And that may depend on what he does and what she concludes about this race. We heard a little bit from her today. As for those Haley voters, here's what some of them are saying now. If it ends up being Trump or Biden, how do you think you'll, you'll vote in 2024? You know, that's a really good question. I would, I, it's probably going to be Biden just because it's been, you know, four years and, and he hasn't uh, divided. So she doesn't end up uh, winning the primary and, and, and getting the electoral vote. Right. Would you vote for Donald Trump in November? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know what to do. Sounds pretty straightforward, pretty honest. Those are people, those are examples, but those are people, people in the street, as we say, people in the street interviews, where Nikki Haley, what she says and does in these weeks and months ahead could matter a lot to them. So we hear a lot from Washington. We got a lot of lectures about how hot Ron DeSantis would be or how things would go down. And turns out we have to do something pretty traditional sometimes, even in this cacophony of all of this polarization and new technology and new stuff. Sometimes in a democracy, you have to just buckle up Pay attention, listen to the voters. And there's plenty to be depressed about in America. I'm not going to sugarcoat any of that for you here on the news, but it is interesting and perhaps hopeful to see some change, some premises smashed, some barriers broken, and the voters telling a story that at least is more nuanced, more rich, more thoughtful than some of what we were lectured about from the pundits earlier in this cycle. For the first time, we can report both parties each now have a presumptive nominee. Haley's exit from the race after Trump's wins last night tees up a Biden-Trump rematch. So even though we love our election music, we might need to change it to something more fitting. Yeah, one more time. Remember that one as the song goes? One more time. As we do this matchup, although we should know most Americans would prefer someone else, new choices. People are not celebrating as they did in the Daft Punk classic. And there's a lot of commentary and merch making a similar point. If you go back across history, losing candidates don't usually make another run at the White House. Losing presidents rarely ask the electorate to give them another chance, which is why there's a teddy bear on your screen. You'd have to go back to the original inspiration for the teddy bear for an example of a former president running again, like when former president Teddy Roosevelt ran for the old job he had against the current president, Taft. It was dubbed the great mustache election of 1912. Trump is hoping for a different outcome than that former president who lost in what was a three-way race to Wilson. Now, we should know, Democrats keep beating expectations in recent elections. Strong midterms in 2022, the 2018 blue wave, Biden, of course, beating Trump in 2020. But the Electoral College actually makes things much closer. Consider, as we're now in this Daft Punk rematch, that Trump first won the Electoral College with three close states and a combined margin, you see right there, of 77,000. Seven million more Americans chose Biden last time, of course. But in the three closest states that cycle, his total margin was also super narrow, coming in around 42,000 in Arizona, Wisconsin, and Georgia combined. So, yes, it's one more time for this standoff with many Americans telling us they're over it before it even begins. Now, as promised, I want to welcome back James. 
and tell you, James, uh, in your honor, we want to tell you this is a special day that we are inaugurating today, and we hope it repeats. We're calling it James Day. You can see the new graphic there with you and other presidents and you throughout the years. Uh, welcome back, sir. Welcome to James Day. Well, well, thank you. What an honor to have a day named after me. <laughs> right? We're not the government. <laughs> but a day that lives in infamy. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, FDR, I hope not. Uh, we'll, we'll make yeah. it live in wisdom. Um, there we go. I played Daft Punk. A lot of people remember that classic song. One more time, we're going to celebrate. Because the song's about people wanting to celebrate again. I know you love Mardi Gras and music and celebrations. Right. I think you also know the facts. And on both sides, there's a lot of people who aren't ushering in this one more time. So with that mood, what do you see coming out of Super Tuesday? What's important? What are you watching? What do you say to that? Well, the polling is discouraging. You know, it's a little bit like walking on your grandma naked. It's hard to unsee them. I mean, <laughs> that, but th there are some things that are in, in President Biden's favor. Trump is, is, is massively unpopular also. And I saw something today in a Tom Etzel column that fascinated me. Forty-five percent of Americans don't know anything or very little about the charges against Trump. So to me, that, that tells me there's a, a knowledge vacuum out there. Usually when you have two incumbents, everything is known about both of them, and it's, it, it's kind of hard to move numbers. But I thought that was encouraging. And this, you know, this trial coming up on March 25th is going to be a pretty big event. People, I think, are, are downplaying that. And I, I, I think it, if, he gets, if he's acquitted or hung jury, it's going to give his people a big boost and a lot of energy. However, you well know that once you're convicted of a felony, your entire life changes. I mean, you, you, you don't have the same day. You have to give up your passport. You got to get permission to travel. It probably won't jail him pending appeal, but it, when you're convicted, it, it, that, it's a different world that he's going to live in. And uh, so I, I, I think we're going to have to pay sufficient attention to that. I don't know if the legal process is going to save us. Or, or a lot of people try to believe that, but there's a lot of knowledge to fill in that the, the Democrats and President Biden can do that I think can help some. We need help. And I'm, I'm not sugarcoating this thing at all. Hmm. We're not in an advantageous position right now. Interesting to hear you put it like that, starkly. Uh, we showed old James agreeing with new James, current James, uh, that polls only take you so far. Uh, we, we saw that in the clip. Um, but last night we got a lot of results. I was telling vo uh, uh, viewers that we heard from more states with more voters last night than any other point this year, uh, and big states. So the population represented last night was roughly over 40 percent of America. Uh, and so I'm curious what you make of what they're saying. Biden's not running with real strong opponents, but uh, we're seeing numbers that rival the Obama reelection numbers in terms of his unifying the Democratic Party, even amidst the, the issues you mentioned. Uh, and we see Trump putting up numbers that got Haley out, um, but don't yet show party unity. Uh, what did you take from the numbers last night? Well, I don't take, I mean, they both had command and leads all the way through. Uh, President Biden did not have, you know, very much opposition. Haley, you know, ran a gutsy campaign. She got 25, 30 percent in a lot of places. But all right, this is what I, I really think. We're going to have a hard time replicating the 2020 coalition, particularly mm. among under 30 and non-white. And for President Biden to come back to win this thing, we're going to have to do better with kind of middle voters, swing voters, loosely aligned, which the good news is we are doing that. We're not winning elections on turnout. We're actually winning elections with, I, I don't know, better word than swing voters. I'd say less hardly aligned voters we're doing pretty well with. And we, I see that across the board. We're going to have to do that. We cannot rely on Democratic turnout to carry the day for us. It's, I don't, I don't, it, it's, it's striking to hear you now. say that, because, James, the under 30 was uh, the single uh, largest uh, gap, largest edge right. Biden had demographically over Trump last time. Well, black voters, for, for sure, but the, 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 the black numbers are, are, are tepid. I mean, we got to address that. And I don't, I don't know if it's possible to replicate the 2020. And the under 30 is decidedly unenthusiastic or detached right now. I mean, hmm. that's pretty clear. Now, the, 
what, what I'm sure the White House would say is, look, they, and at the end of the day, they're going to come back. The question is, did it come back in sufficient numbers with sufficient turnout? I, I'm, I, I just don't think we can rely on the same coalition uh, this November as we did November four years ago. I, I really don't. Hmm. I, I'd like to be proven wrong, trust me. No, I know you would, uh, but we appreciate your candor and people at the White House and the Biden campaign would be concerned about what you're saying because uh, that, that was part of the coalition. First time voters, young voters, and as you say, uh, a lot of black and brown Democratic voters and uh, soft sporadics who basically said, yeah, we got to do this, got to stop Trump and COVID didn't help Trump. Um, on the Republican side, though, again, we're trying to do both here and, uh, and be right, accurate. Right. I want to show you the numbers I mentioned earlier in the broadcast. This is before you joined us. This was before... Uh, probably both of the old school clips I play to you, James. Uh, Nikki Haley won 25 percent of the vote here in 11 states this cycle. That's new numbers from last night. Uh, the support for Haley in critical swing states mentioned uh, even higher than other places. Then we have limited exit polling. This is just from a couple of places. But where the question was asked, and this has to do with sort of how they how they poll it, they didn't do it everywhere. But in the states selected, pretty strong uh, a uh, third of uh, those voters saying they're not going to back the GOP nominee in November, which we discussed this last night with Rachel and Lawrence and everyone that's understood to refer to Trump. Uh, Biden now saying, quote, Trump made it clear he doesn't want Haley's supporters. I want to be clear there's a place for them in my campaign. <laughs> James. Oh, please, please. Is there a place for yeah, you? That. <laughs> we, we need these. We need these voters. And, and I I've never I, I got to say Trump says things that I've never heard anyone say before. I've never heard a politician. Maybe somebody point out. Say, I don't want these voters. I mean, yeah, usually wild. politicians are like, yeah, come, sure. Come on. Welcome to the party. Uh, it, he's he, he's weak. And that that's the encouraging part. He's weak and he's not he's not he says some of the he's getting increasingly crazy. I, 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 don't, I don't know how to judge it. I'm not a psychiatrist or, or anything like that. But he's always been said a lot of really stupid things, but he looks like he's increasing. And we're going to need that. We're going to need those Haley voters. We're going to need Trump to 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 make a, a, a lot of gaffes. And, you know, we're going to need to catch up. So what do a, Democrats a say to those Haley voters? That you you don't want a, a criminal in the White House. You don't want somebody who it looks to a lot of people was treasonous, that was uh, colluding with, with, with Putin, that was showing national security documents, that was disobeying, uh, not responding to legally legal subpoenas and requests from the archives, uh, that a guy that's got uh, adjudicated by jury to have sexually assaulted, in the words of the judge, raped a woman. Uh, the people don't know that. Was adjudicated by the, the court of law as being a business fraud of the first order to the extent that he was ordered to pay like 400 something million dollars and they had a receiver that, that is now in charge of his properties in New York City. So there's a lot, there's a lot of information there that these loosely aligned voters don't have yet. And a lot of these voters were well, Haley voters that don't like Trump. It, she was getting 30 percent, 35 percent. Just put the numbers on there. Those are those are terrible numbers for some for an president who's in effect an incumbent. So his weakness is real, and it, it, it has to be exploited, and there's a lot of wet work left to do, if you know what I mean.